Hello, and welcome again to another live discussion of DiEM25, a radical political movement for Europe. We're back after the summer break with another season of live discussions with our coordinating team, featuring ideas you won't hear anywhere else. This has been an eventful summer with some significant shifts in the international order. Tonight, we talk about them and ask ourselves, what's your place in all of this? Now, these events are global in nature, but a few important recent developments have taken place in Africa, a continent more colonized and exploited by European powers than any other. Just weeks ago, coup d'etat in Niger and Gabon removed historical European allies from office. Other countries in West Africa, like Burkina Faso, have also seen coups take place in recent years, with the new military governments often enjoying significant popular support. And some of these leaders are claiming they want to reassess their deep new colonial ties with Europe, particularly France, while Paris and its remaining West African allies reject the authority of these governments and even threaten war. And in August, in Johannesburg, in the south of the continent, leaders from the BRICS, the most powerful emerging economies in the world, made key announcements. A major expansion of the bloc, with six new countries scheduled to join next year, a commitment to reducing dependency on the US dollar, and a promise to promote green growth. Now, are the BRICS nations offering a blueprint for a more just world? Could the wave of upheavals in Africa lead to an end to European exploitation? And what role, if any, should progressives in Europe want for our countries in these unfolding stories? That's what we discussed tonight with Yanis Varoufakis and our, panels of, our panel of activists, thinkers, and doers. And you, of course, if you have any thoughts or questions for us, please throw them at us in the chats and we'll get to them as best as we can. Now, i like to kick things off by uh, introducing a new face here uh, to our coordinating collective, Namazulu Tata, originally from Zimbabwe, based in Bremen, or at least in Germany for many decades now. Noma, welcome. And uh, I'd like to ask, you to ask you to kick things off for us. You wrote an article recently for our website um, on the coup in, in Niger uh, that very comprehensively made the argument that you see this not as a coup, but as a realignment. Can you explain why you believe that? I believe you are muted. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak to you regarding the situation in, in, in Africa. Yeah, I said in my article that this article, this coup is not a coup. These coups, they are not coups as such, but they are realignment. Um, what I mean by that is that um, voters are shifting their allegiance to, from the government to the military. Now, there are many coups in, in, in West Africa. I think there are about uh, 110 since the beginning of the independence or uh, independence time, the 1960s. You know, it's, it started with Ghana, and then there was Togo, you know, it was coups and counter coups. But now, let me just narrow down to these coups that had uh, three months ago. You know, there was a coup in Burkina Faso. We didn't hear France talking too much. And then there was a coup again in Chad and uh, in Mali. And then when there was a coup, in Niger, then everything changed. Um, France was all out to go to Mali and reinstate the president, um, the democratically elected president. Now, my question is, why not other countries? Why Mali? Yeah. So, um, now, the situation in West Africa is that ECOWAS is an organization that is supposed to be economic. Now it has turned into a military uh, entity that is supposed to 
march in and reinstate a elected government. Now, was that government elected or were they, was there a coup? Uh, not in the military sense, but in the sense that it is elections in Africa, they are always manipulated by the colonizers most of the time, not all the time. So um, yeah, we see each, we see ourselves in a situation where by Niger, anytime it will be it will be invaded, yeah. not by France, but but by African countries. This is a dimension that has always been that um, you know African presidents have always acted in favor of the colonizers most of the time, you know. Uh, it is inconceivable that um, countries in West Africa would group, would produce an army that is financed by France to invade another African country, just incon inconceivable even in Nigeria itself, because Nigeria plays a big part in West Africa. There's got a population of 250. Other countries have got very small populations, even their armies are very small. It simply means that it's Nigeria going to Niger to overthrow the military government that has taken part. Taken part. The thing is this, Niger is, <clears throat> Niger is, um, supported by the population on the ground. So what ground does uh, France and the equals, part of the equals, have to go and reinstate a president who has been rejected by the people on the ground? I think this is the bone of contention that we still need to yeah, look into seriously. You know, so, um, these are young people that took, uh, took over the government. The question is, are these young people saying, we have been disappointed by our elders, you know, our forefathers, by the way they, in which they you know, uh, ruled these countries, not in the interest of the population, but in the interest of the colonizers all the time. I remember um, when uh, South Africa got independent, it was not anywhere different from how these countries got independent. Because um, South Africa, yes, it got, it got its independence politically, but economically, South Africa remained intact, remained an apartheid um, country um, all the time. You know, um, yeah, um, countries north of South Africa, they looked to South Africa as a solution. That was in 1994 when Mandela came out of prison. So they were wholly disappointed when South Africa did not get that independence they wanted. So, all our eyes were on South Africa. And um, ANC disappointed Africa. And I think there was a moment where Africa resigned completely. You know, they were disappointed in the way Mandela handled the processes leading to independence in, in, uh, in South Africa. So now, here comes a young, young text, you know, military boys that are just simply saying, we have had enough, we are taking over the governments, and then we see how we can liberate ourselves, especially from France. So I think in a nutshell, this is what my article was talking about. Thank you very much, Noma. Uh, Yanis. 
What's your view on this? You're also muted. Okay, uh, let me begin by uh, welcoming in public Noma to our team, to the coordinating collective of DiEM25. Uh, thank you for your article. Thank you for your introduction. Uh, is it wonderful to have an African voice uh, being represented here, as opposed to us, you know, white Europeans again pontificating on matters beyond our borders, south of the Mediterranean, on matters that uh, um, pertain to Africa? Um, a number of comments. The first one is um, history is repeating itself. What is happening now in the sub-Saharan African continent, in Niger and in other Burkina Faso and so on, with various uh, military coups, changes of government. Uh, by the way, they are not all the same cases. Each one of them has its own particularities. Let's not bundle them together, right? But the general feel of um, these regime changes. Um, in I'm, I'm not saying anything different to what Norma is saying, but I'm just going to add a slightly different angle from which to look at things. Well, it resembles what happened in Northern Africa in the 1950s and 60s, in the Arab part of Africa. Uh, you will recall that uh, Egypt, for instance, Iraq, are two examples that were essentially and and a lot of a large part of arabia uh were under the thumb of the british empire of the of the british who unlike the french in algeria in morocco they were not running these countries as if they were part and parcel of the metropolis france was pretending that algeria was part of france right um algerians had French citizenship. The English were different. They never officially took over Egypt, for instance. They had a government, a king, King Farouk in Egypt. There was a government, Egyptian government, supposedly it was an independent state, but it wasn't. It was completely run and taken over by the British. And the British were using Africa, Northern Africa, and uh, the Middle East more generally, places like Iraq, in order to um, gain geostrategic advantages versus other superpowers of the time, raw materials, trade, and uh, markets as well. Uh, and they had this um, twin policy of um, security and development, they called it. So es essentially, I mean, it was insecurity and underdevelopment, but <laughs> the official uh, version was that they had uh, the army there, the British army, to keep the peace and prevent, you know, the locals from uh, killing each other. That was the, the official ideology of the British Empire. And at the same time, they claimed that they introduced railways, they introduced operas, they introduced schools, and they did they introduce quite a bit of that in the same way that they had done in India. But it was colonialism. Okay, it was colonialism. And at some point, army officers like Nasser, like Saddam Hussein, for that matter, like Gaddafi in Libya, they took up arms and they staged a coup that had many of the uh, features of what's happening in Israel today. Because France, under Macron, is using the British strategy in the Sahel, in the sub-Saharan. Uh, so what were they doing in Mali? What were they doing in Niger? Security and development. Our French army to keep the peace and supposedly development. It's exactly the same playbook. Macron copied, the, you know, played a British game in sub-Saharan Africa. The result is the same. A coup d'etat, which is supported by the people in exactly the same way that Saddam Hussein, the Ba'ath Party, was supported in Iraq, in Syria, um, and of course, under Nasser, massive support that Nasser received 
in North Africa, in uh, Egypt, Gaddafi in, um, in Libya. Progressives in Europe, as well as progressive Africans, North Africans and Arabs, looked at those resurrections, those coups, coup d'etats, as a positive thing, because they did throw off the yoke of the European colonials, colonial power. But we know how it ended. We know that simply putting your trust in military men who take over, and even if they do the right thing of getting rid of the colonial armies, whether they were the British then or the French today, uh, is not a good idea. My great fear is that we are now having um, a, a repetition of what happened in Egypt, in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, in the Sahel, uh, with new players, Russia, through Wagner in particular, and China, who are far more benign because they never send troops, they send money, which is always preferable to sending troops. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless, it's another way of um, treating Africans as objects, not as subjects, continuing colonialism by other means. So, um, until and unless a democratic African movement springs up in those countries, uh, saying thank you to the military officers that got rid of the French troops, but no thank you, you're not going to be running our lives. Uh, there will probably be a repetition of the tragedy of Egypt and of Libya and of Syria and of Iraq. Uh, one last point, uh, Noma. Um, I was a member of the ANC back in the late 70s, early 80s in Britain. Uh, we were all rooting for um, Nelson Mandela to come out of prison at a time when Margaret Thatcher was uh, clearly labeling him a terrorist and calling for his continued imprisonment. Let us not forget all that, right? Because now Nelson Mandela has been deified, sanctified in the Western uh, liberal press. But back then, the very same people who are now sanctifying Nelson Mandela were treating him like a terrorist, right? Anyway, he was a great man. There is no doubt about that. Uh, but like Noma, I also decry and lament the way in which the ANC in government essentially accepted economic apartheid. So formal freedom, formal equality, that was important. We should not belittle how important that was. Uh, we should not belittle the Truth and Reconciliation Commission process. That was an important process. Um, a lot of uh, restitution took place through the uh, Truth and Reconciliation process. The Constitution of South Africa is a brilliant text. We should all be proud of the Constitution of South Africa. But under the shadow of uh, these formal rights and beautiful texts uh, and the change of guard in government, apartheid is stronger than ever. Not legally. I mean, I'm, I'm pleased that you, know, you have the formal right <laughs> as a black person uh, to move around in South Africa without being uh, harassed by the police, but given the maintenance of property rights over land and mines, land and mines, that's the main source of strength and power in South Africa. The fact that these property rights remain within the white community and remain within the multinational companies that still own the minefield, the mines, diamond mines, uh, gold mines, and particular coal mines, um, apartheid will continue. So national liberation is a struggle that needs to be supported, but we must be very mindful that a dictatorship, 
a black dictatorship can rise up that may be worse than the white one in the sense that at least when you have a white face in the face of uh, you know Bota in uh, South Africa or um, that horrible man in uh, Rhodesia, what was his name? Uh, at least you can see the enemy. You say, all right, these are the white oppressors. We get rid of them. We'll be fine. But when you have black faces representing very fierce capitalist dictatorships run by white companies, then that that that's, for me, I don't know whether I have the right to say that, but I'll say it. It's darker and grimmer. Thank you. Thank you, Yanis. A couple of questions from the chat. Salman asks, is there a good coup and a bad coup, considering what's happening in Africa? And another question, will BRICS use blockchain technologies to wean off the US dollar and its hegemony, which is something that I'm sure we'll we'll get to later in this uh, in this discussion. Um, I like to bring in our other voice from Africa here now, uh, Amir Kiai from South Africa, raised in South Africa. Forget where you were even born, Amir. You're such a true internationalist, but based in the Netherlands now. Um, I'm sure you have your opinions on what's the what's what we're currently speaking about, but I also wanted to ask you about the BRIC summit, uh, which took place in South Africa. Um, and how do you see the developments that took place there, specifically the um, important announcement that the bloc is going to expand finally, which I know that in uh, Brazil, for example, where I'm from, was viewed with a certain level of skepticism, I think in the Western media in general, as an attempt by China to sort of dilute the, the powers inside of the bloc and make it more dominant. How do you see all that? Um, well, this is definitely a development of where we are now internationally, of course, you know, and the realignment in global politics and global order, if I can use that word in that sense, because uh, we've seen the major shift that happened, for example, in the Middle East, when the, um, Saudi Arabia and Iran started reconciling. That was a huge shift, and that was a moving away of Saudi Arabia a little bit away from the United States. And sort of these shifts, as the global landscape is changing, we start seeing this um, new coalescing of states, not necessarily the global public body, but states around you know, these kind of loose alliances. Um, and these are loose in the sense that you see, for example, BRICS countries that are also part of G20 uh, and so on. So it's never exactly clear um, ideologically, ideologically where this uh, new development will take those countries, if you will, from that point of view. Uh, in that sense. And um, when it comes to, and also one of the questions that we have as well on the, for the, for the discussion tonight is around, uh, can the emboldened BRICS really lead the world, the world into a fair, lead the world into a fairer international order? At the moment, the answer is more on the no than the yes. Uh, the recent, for example, the recent communique the Johannesburg uh, communique. Uh, I'm just going to quote a little bit here because it's very indicative of where they're going. Uh, talks of centering the International Monetary Fund uh, using the governance framework that's coming out of the G20 and maintaining capital adequacy frameworks and so on and so on and so on. If you if it didn't say BRICS on top, you wouldn't think that it's a BRICS declaration, you know, in that sense. And, uh, you know, we know that uh, one of the you know the biggest strangle hopes uh, for any development uh, fair development is debt and uh, uh, 24 african countries for example spend more on interest payments than healthcare and so on and you know we've seen it we've seen how in the west we were happy to bail out the banks <laughs> Cancel debt, the German debts, um, the Second World War debt was cut by half, for example, in the 50s, etc. So debt forgiveness is a tool that uh, we in Europe will use for our own benefits. 
uh, but we are really rarely reaching that option when it comes to dealing with uh, quote unquote the global south. And here also on this issue, the BRICS declaration is quite telling because um, they do note the high levels of debt issue. However, the solution is, and I'm reading quoting here, addressing debt vulnerabilities according to the G20 common framework for debt treatment. We're not seeing, uh, again, so, you know, we might see geopolitical rhetoric that is maybe anti-West and imperialist, etc. cetera. Uh, but when it comes to actual action, it's still, con you know, maintaining the international order. It's not really uh, looking to change it. It might reform it slightly towards its own benefit, but we're not seeing any uh, major moves to, um, you know, begin a new uh, or radically de depart uh, from uh, what we have right now. So that is uh, that is the problem. And also, what should Europe's place be? And I think that's also an important question to really get into it. And, I, and I'm hinting a bit, of course, at the debt issue as a very lo easy, low-hanging fruit, um, given that there's enough accounts of how much um, wealth has been taken from uh, former colonies and current colonies. Um, as well as also interestingly how Haiti had to repay France back <laughs> for um, its revolution, right? It had to pay back uh, over a 150 year period or so, um, vast sums of money because uh, during independence, slave owners lost business. Yeah. So this issue of reparations and issue of uh, debt relief is, is something that Europe can easily, and I'm saying easily, do. The more difficult options, um, the other options are more difficult partially because of our lack of independence of the of Europe in making bigger decisions for itself. Thank you, Amir. Let me bring Norma back in with a with a quick question, and then we'll we'll move on with uh, with some new speakers. Norma, please. Yeah, um, Amir was in South Africa recently. And um, yeah, my question is, um, how does South Africa fit in into the BRICS? What has the South African government to offer in BRICS in terms of uh, trade? Because that economy is not their economy, just like what Yanis said. Uh, that economy belongs to globalists, to apartheid. Uh, uh, Globalists. So, what are they offering the BRICS? I'm sorry to say this is somebody who comes from Africa, but uh, somehow I feel um, if the globalist, the apartheid economy, would like to be part of that uh, BRICS, are they not going to sabotage? Because BRICS means um, leaving the dollar you know, hegemony, you know, setting up their own structures. So um, don't you see the danger there? Um, yeah, that's my question. Mia, yeah. quick answer before we go. Yeah, on. sure, of course. Um, I don't necessarily see the danger because I also don't see necessarily the the BRICS set up wanting to create a completely different infrastructure away from um, the current, you know, uh, trade international trade system. Uh, it looks like uh, the WTO, World Trade Organization system is is still on the cards. China is very much in favor of that, and so on. So you know, we, there could be some in terms of planning and creating an alternative structure, sure. They were, they're talking about potentially a common currency. There was a actually a hundred, uh, whatever denomination bill, I know, give, gifted, for example, that I saw going around in Twitter with the different countries uh, logo and so on. Uh, but it's not necessarily sabotage because there's no intention to radically transform anything in that sense. So if that helps you. Thank you, Amir. A question from the chat from uh, Imogen. How do we convince current leaders in Europe to cancel that, though? It's a very good question, and I hope someone else can uh, share their thoughts on on, uh, on on this as well. But just to mention quickly, 
Uh, if you're not familiar with it, there's a great campaign that DM25 is actually a part of, a part of called That for Climate that tries to do exactly that um, using the, the climate as a, as a motivator to build a popular movement um, that will reach this eventual final goal of uh, canceling the debt in developing nations to help them fund their, their green transitions. So we'll leave a link to that in the chat in case you want to read more about it. Um, but again, just another another one, more food for thought for, for our panel here. Uh, let's go to Johannes now, based in uh, Germany. Go ahead, Johannes. Thank you, Lucas. Um, hello from Berlin. I wanted to pick up something that was said in the chat, which was uh, what's a good coup and what's a bad coup. And I think, um, of course, there's not only two categories where we, you know, can clearly categorize, uh, you know, overthrow of government um, in all kinds of uh, different uh, nations around the world. But I think it's very important to look at what was there before and how do you categorize that and what's coming after. And in, in you know, case of Niger, I think, you know, it's yet to say what comes after. I think the government there the new military government has said that they want to do a transition and in three years do uh, do election or something like that. But that's, of course, uh, remain to be seen um, what's actually coming. Um, I think if we look at these, um, yeah, these things, then, of course, we need to see if, you know, a good coup is, of course, a revolution supported by the people. Um, and I think if we also look at the European history, for example, Portugal, where, you know, the dictatorship was overthrown by lower ranks of the military in support by the people um, and were replaced, uh, was replaced with a democracy. I think this is what you can call maybe a good coup. Of course, we call it a revolution, rightfully so. And uh, I think, um, yeah, of course, from us afar, it's very difficult to yet determine um, what we're looking at uh, in those countries in the Zara zone in, in Africa. Um, another question is for us in Europe uh, and other parts of the world, of course, what to do in these um, circumstances where there is uncertainty. We don't know if, uh, you know, who's acting in good or bad faith and in which interest. And I think um, for that reason, it is very important for us to do one thing, which is try to establish direct links to people in the country and not necessarily, you know, government officials or something like that, but organizations where we know um, people from organizations where we know that they have similar values than us and, um, you know, gather information um, this way and um, try also to maybe, you know, influence through dialogue. Um, uh, different organizations in the country that we in the future can work with. Of course, always, you know, not as colonizers and the colonized and as, you know, Europeans telling someone what they should do, but as, you know, on, on high level uh, discussions about the future, uh, for example, of Europe and Africa together run, run by the people. And I think uh, this kind of practice solidarity is the way to go. And of course, also, if now in Niger, I think, you know, people are starting to call for, you know, uh, war and invasion, then it's very important for us to stand against that, because I think this would be a catastrophe. Um, war is, you know, never a good thing. Uh, the, the opposite of development of, of a country. And um, yeah, I think that should be um, what what we are doing if we are not uh, on the ground in the country. Thank you. Thanks, Johannes. And I think you touched upon an, an, an important point there, this um, discussion that might seem semantic, semantic, but it's not really about what's a coup and what's a, what's a revolution, right? I think that's a, a hard issue. Um, Judith, Judith Meyer from, from Germany, though far away from Germany at the moment. Yeah, uh, right now in America, which makes this doubly interesting um, from Germany in America talking about Africa. Um, yeah, and of course, uh, I uh, don't claim to know all that much about um, uh, the African continent, certainly not more than Noma here. Um, but one thing that I would like uh, to add to, to the 
to the thought process uh, is a long, more long-term question, a uh, more long-term consideration, which for me is nevertheless, um, it has a certain urgency. Uh, and the issue is uh, language, because uh, right now, um, most of Africa runs on uh, colonizer languages. Uh, and that gives a huge advantage uh, to the white minorities uh, in Africa, uh, as well as uh, to people with good connections uh, to France, uh, to Britain, and so on. Uh, it also um, holds back uh, the education of people raised uh, in traditional African languages, because it is so much harder uh, for someone uh, whose uh, native language uh, is, uh, let's say, a Bantu language, to, um, to, uh, to learn French or, or English, than uh, to learn another Bantu language. So uh, I believe that uh, if uh, Africa wants to really emancipate itself, it has to consider the question of language and consider, for example, uh, whether uh, universities uh, in Nigeria might offer programs in Hausa, uh, which students from Niger, Niger might also attend uh, in Hausa uh, in order to have uh, a new kind of uh, education. Similarly, to convert primary schools uh, to African languages in order to make it easier uh, for African students uh, to, uh, to complete primary and also secondary school. Uh, and uh, maybe make this um, the language uh, of government that would require companies, the corporations that currently have so much influence over these countries to employ people who speak, let's say, Hausa or Swahili or uh, whatever the language uh, uh, you choose for uh, for your country. Obviously, it's not my, uh, my choices. It has to be the choice of the people uh, over there. But I believe that uh, switching to African languages uh, would automatically require some kind of um, uh, reorganization of uh, of the economy because uh, the the elites who speak French are not the elites that speak Hausa. Uh, they would have to employ a lot more um, African people and uh, less people who come straight from France and just tell everyone local what to do. Uh, if you make it a requirement for uh, the um, managers of the company to speak to the government uh, in Hausa, you're not going to have Europeans in that position. Simple as that. And this is also a question that relates uh, to our second topic, uh, the, uh, the BRICS. Uh, I would highly encourage the BRICS to find a language that is not English in order to reduce the influence of uh, propaganda from the United States, which is mainly uh, in English. People acquire all this propaganda in unconsciously just by watching Netflix, just by reading uh, English uh, literature uh, or whatever books come out. Uh, if there was another language that the BRICS could use to encourage also people to study uh, in each other's countries, let's say someone from Brazil going to Russia uh, to study or vice versa, uh, right now, the only way they could do that would be by learning uh, English and going to whatever English language programs are offered at those universities. Now, imagine there is a cooperation where some universities offer, Brazilian universities offer programs uh, in Russian or Russian or universities offer programs uh, in Portuguese or, or even better. Both of these universities offer programs in Esperanto and then people from Egypt uh, and from other countries could also attend it without spending years of their life learning the language uh, of uh, a country that has no business uh, in this relationship between two countries that want to become more independent. Thank you, Judith. Let's go now to Daphne, Daphne Dalkada, based in France, originally from Turkey. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I just want to um, <laughs> swaying away from uh, quite a bit from what you did said, but uh, nevertheless, still within the theme. Um, I mean, it's very hard not to be um, like when Yanis was saying, like the history is repeating itself, maybe not repeating exactly, but you know, prehistory doesn't repeat itself, it rhymes. <laughs> uh, it's very um, I was briefly reminded of an old interview uh, I'd watched on some major American uh, network, uh, maybe MSNBC, something like this. And it was um, the it was an interview with the president uh, of, um, I mean, the president of South Africa during apartheid de Klerk. Uh, and he was mentioning, 
which something that disturbed me a lot, but he was mentioning it in a way that was quite almost triumphless. And he was uh, underlining how he was able to, I mean, they were able to end apartheid uh, because there was uh, no longer the threat of communism because they didn't think that like it was the end of his, it was the beginning of the end of history so there was no competing alternative or no competing pole if you like uh, and then they felt safe enough to change the system then when there was no alternative in um, in play and I think uh, I always come back to this in these uh, talks, but I mean, I, it really comes back to me, for me, to the uh, multipolarity, the, uh, like being at the end of end of history now, like the end of multipolarity. And here we are discussing the coups in Africa and we are discussing uh, the new BRICS. So uh, I just can't help but remark and remember this really strange uh, interview that was like maybe 10 years ago or like, that I listened to it, but it really like stuck with me that he didn't even feel bad saying this it was something that he was proud to say. Um, so this might maybe feel off topic, but I don't know, it felt really relevant to me. So I just want to add that. Thank you, Daphne. Yanis, when that question in the chat came in about the possible use of blockchain technology uh, by the BRICS to counter the dollar hegemony, I could see already itching to get back in the discussion. So I'd like to bring you back in. Um, we have some other questions in the in our internal chat here as well on this topic. But before, just to take a, a quick step back, I, you know, you were in uh, in Cuba earlier this year, you gave a, a, a speech there talking at length about this and many other uh, very important geopolitical topics. But just to take a, a step back, because I feel like if, if you're not educated in economics, it can sometimes be difficult to understand what is it that we're even talking about? What is it about the US dollar? that's so magical. If you're a buyer in China and I'm a seller in Brazil, why can't you just convert your currency to my currency? We trade and everybody goes home happy. What is it that makes a dollar such a powerful weapon for the US? In brief, the huge trade deficit of the United States. What really makes the dollar powerful is that the United States is in the red. It keeps buying stuff from China, from Europe, from Africa, from Asia, a lot more stuff than what it sells. That sounds very weird because for an African country, for Greece, for, you know, normal countries, when you have a big trade deficit, then you're in trouble. <laughs> then your currency depreciates. Then you have debt crisis. Then the IMF comes to you and then very soon after that you lose your schools your roads your hospitals um your people are thrown out of their homes how is it that the united states have managed to turn a trade deficit into the greatest instrument of colonial power in the history of humanity because that's what it is because if you think about it yeah we talk about the BRICS, right a cautionary note to begin with. Atlanticists, NATO propagandists, the EU um, you know, cadres, they underestimate the BRICS. We progressives overestimate the BRICS. Let's not make either mistake. The BRICS is not going to be, um, at least not in the next 10, 20 years, um, an alternative to the G7, to Western capitalism. It is not going to be the new Soviet Union, the new um, you know, source of internationalism and socialism. Uh, and at the same time, it is not insignificant. But let's, okay, that's closing the bracket. Let's go back to the American trade deficit. Imagine you are a capitalist in Shanghai and you have a factory producing aluminum. And where do you sell this to? The United, United States, that's whom you send it, you, whom you send your aluminum to. Why can the, uh, you, the United States purchaser, buyer, buy it from you? Because the American has dollars and uses dollars to buy uh, your aluminum. Now, 
this is the trade deficit. The fact that they can keep buying stuff without selling by printing dollars, which says then the Chinese capitalist, what does the Chinese capitalist do with the dollars that he gets from selling aluminum? He takes it to, to Wall Street and there he buys American debt. Therefore, he finances the American government and he buys real estate. He buys you know, properties in Miami, in California, in Chicago, in New York. And therefore, you've got this recycling scheme. The greatest threat, the reason why the BRICS are not going to be a significant um, threat to the dollar is because Russian capitalists, Chinese capitalists, Indian capitalists, Indonesian capitalists, United Arab Emirates capitalists, they do not want to see the dollar being displaced by any currency, digital, crypto, or normal. They want the dollar to remain completely and utterly dominant because their loot, their wealth is in dollars and it lives in the United States financial system. Right? That is the issue. Now, why are we... But by the way, um, take the BRICS, right? Take the acronym BRICS. You're talking about language. All right, let's talk about language. Who came up with the acronym BRICS? A guy called O'Neill, Jim O'Neill. What was Jim O'Neill, the chief economist of Goldman Sachs? He came up with the idea of the BRICS. He was making the point that if you are investing money, you, you forget about the West. You should invest it in countries like Brazil, in Russia, in China. And in order to make it snazzy, to give it a marketing edge to his article, he calls it, he called it, I asked him, why, why, did, why did you put South Africa in there, the S of BRICS, once I met Jim O'Neill? Do you know what he said to me? Because brick, one brick didn't sound good, and I wanted an S. So he added South Africa in there. So this is the degree of Anglo-European-American dominance that now all, all the developing world is looking at the BRICS as their savior, and the BRICS is an acronym concocted by the chief economist of Goldman Sachs, right? Now, it's not insignificant. It's not insignificant because an increasing amount of international trade is not going to be in dollars. And I think the most interesting event of the last weeks is when we heard that Argentina repaid a few billion dollars that it owed to the International Monetary Fund using Chinese one. If you couple that with the news that uh, the new development bank, uh, which is the BRICS bank, um, where Dilma is the president, the former Brazilian president, is going to be lending in local currencies. Huh? And also there's another outfit of the BRICS, a separate outfit, that is going to try to replace the IMF. So one, when one country, which is associated with the BRICS, let's say South Africa, um, or you know any other country that joins the BRICS in some associative form, when they have a problem with the balance of payments, when they can't repay their bankers in Germany, the bankers in England, the bankers in France, in America, then this BRICS IMF version of the IMF will come in and lend them in local currencies. Now, what does this mean? What does it mean to be lent in local currencies? Well, when Argentina repaid its IMF installment, it was something like four or five billion dollars, using one, all right? What that means is this, the Chinese repaid it using their own dollar stock. If, they, if, if this new development bank under Dilma lends to Argentina or to South Africa or to Zambia, if they lend money in local currency, okay, right, in South Africa rand to the South African government, what does that mean? I mean, the, 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 the BRICS bank does not have rand to give. What it has is dollars. Okay, or one. It can give them one, or it can give them dollars. Now, for that loan to South Africa to be useful to South Africa, the South Africans, the South, South African man, uh, government that takes on this loan, must be able to buy stuff from America, from Europe, 
from India. They will have to pay in dollars. So essentially, they get dollars from the BRICS bank, but they have to repay in the future with interest the dollars that it cost initially to give the rand. What does this mean? It means that if the rand devalues 50% in the next 10 years, when the, the loan has to be repaid, this is a good thing for South Africa because South Africa will have inflation. The same quantity of rand in 10 years' time will be worth half as much. So they effectively will have to be repay to the BRICS bank half the money. So it's negative interest rates for the BRICS bank. Who is going to suffer for this? The Chinese, because they are, only, they are the only ones amongst the BRICS that have a big wad of dollars. So essentially, the BRICS bank means that the Chinese are using their stock of dollars in order to lend the countries that take loans from the BRICS bank and take on itself, Beijing will take on its shoulders, the devaluation risk, which now, when an African country borrows, uh, the devaluation risk is its own. It will have to, to pay for it. Now, why would the Chinese do that? Well, one reason is because they have too many dollars. <laughs> In the sense that, you know, because they have a very large current account surplus, they keep, with every lump of aluminum or car or whatever it is that they or clothes that they sell to the Americans or to the Europeans, they get dollars back, right? What do they do with these dollars? They have to take them to Wall Street. Now, they've seen what happened after the Ukraine war, that the central bank of the United States, the Fed, confiscated 350 billion Russian dollars. So they think, oh, they, can, they may do this to, to, to us. We might as well use our dollars through the BRICS network to gain more influence over South Africa, over Saudi Arabia. Right? So they are socializing amongst the third world, what we used to call the third world, huh? they are dollar holdings. Um, so the, the BRICS is China. Let's not be, let's not beat about the bush here. The BRICS is China with India uh, trying to find a kind of middle road with um, the United, United Arab Emirates playing the West against the BRICS uh, in order to gain advantages like Saudi Arabia wants to negotiate deals. They don't want to get out of the dollar zone, but they want to enhance their relationship with, with China, with the BRICS in order to leverage their own bargaining with uh, the United States. This is all very interesting. But leftists, I, I'm really appalled. Leftists have a tendency to look at the BRICS and say, oh, this, you know, we'll, we are orphans. We in the left are, for, since 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, we've been orphaned. We've been looking at a large power internationally that will look after us, that we will be able to dream that they are our people, that they will defeat the capitalist mammoth, right? Don't make this mistake. That's not what the BRICS is. It's significant. I explained why it is significant, but it is not the new communist international, the new socialist international, the new, you know, um, humanist international. That's not what it is, okay? Uh, one last point, if I may, or a couple of, of points. You did, you made a very good pitch for Esperanto. Everything you said was a pitch for Esperanto. It was not a pitch for local languages. It is crazy for the Africans to use one local language and universalize it. It will not happen. It should not happen. Um, it's a good pitch for Esperanto that we should all, you know, start from zero with a common language that is easy to learn. It's not never going to work. I wish it did, you know, then I would learn Esperanto as well. But it will never work because what happens is some language takes the upper hand uh, for historic reasons. And don't forget, English is not American, it is English. England is becoming increasingly irrelevant. So it doesn't matter, it's a bit like Greece. Ancient Greece yeah, died, and then Greek remained the, uh, the lingua franca of the world, even when Greece was no longer in existence. So England is in no longer is on the verge of not being in existence. I think English is a pretty good common language because the way it works is maximin, the mathematical principle of maximin. That is, we maximize the use of the language that we all have a minimum grasp of. 
And that is English today. Once upon a time, it might have been Spanish or French or Latin. Today, it is English. Uh, and finally, in response to the question in the chat, um, are there good coups and bad coups? Well, if you have a military fascist dictatorship and some military officer overthrows the bastards, that is a good coup, right? And let me give you an example. 1975, Portugal, Otelo de Carvalho, the colonel of the fascist army then. He was a lefty who managed to survive in the army and he overthrew the horrible 60-year-old fascist dictatorship of Portugal. That was a good coup. <laughs> but it's a good coup only if it overturns fascism. Uh, if it overturns demo a democratically elected regime, like in Pinochet, by the way, yesterday we had 50 years from that despicable event. Um, Viva Allende, exposed. Um, then, of course, it's uh, a bad thing. Enough said. Thank you. Thank you, Yanis. Speaking of us leftists, I wanted to uh, invite Noma back in to take us home. Um, and talking about specifically, if you could, Noma, because you touch upon this in your in your article as well. What's our role in all this? Um, not only as leftists, but leftists in our particular time and place, right? Um, and in the in the place by and large here, where uh, these you know we're located in these former colonial powers. What is it that you think we should do um, in order to support this movement building towards democracy, towards development, towards independence in Africa? That's a very good question. Um, there is a lot that we can do. For instance, we are looking at um, Gabon. Gabon, there was a, a coup there. And we think that this coup was organized by France. And we also think that France is going to preempt who's in its colonies that haven't um, changed their regimes yet. We are speaking of a Cameroon. We are speaking of you know, other countries that are in danger of you know, getting coups. Nigeria is another place where a coup can, can happen anytime because the people on that region are not happy about uh, ECOWAS going to Nigeria to, uh, to, to replace an uh, old president. So what we can do here is to really shout, you know, can you imagine a, a, a prime minister like uh, Miloni, you know, she's a hero in Africa, in West Africa, you know, unbelievable. And uh, days ago, I saw uh, a, a diplomat, you know, uh, giving his credentials to a um, president in Burkina Faso. When I saw that, I said, my God, we could do better, you know, uh, drumming up, you know, writing articles, you know, um, really condemning France um, about their moves to want to uh, invade uh, Niger, you know, that uh, we can do here, you know, in a free Europe, you know, we can, you know, uh, write many articles in many uh, media houses, especially in France, you know, and let them know that there are people here uh, who, here in Europe, who are against, you know, um, a, a military action in Niger. That is what I can think of now, you know. Um, uh, yeah, really turning up. You know? Thank you very much for your invitation. Thank you, Noma. Won't be the won't be the last. You'll be with us <laughs> throughout now. Um, thank you so much to the rest of our panel for, for joining us. Uh, and thank you for, for watching and sending us your comments and questions. We're resuming this uh, uh, regular live streams now. So we'll see you again 